All right, so thank you for being here. I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, questions because I think that's at the heart of um, what we want to do uh, in science and in, uh, in this uh, journal. So I'll start with a, a simple question in a way. So what is a researcher? And I think that's something we need to think about a little bit in our community, of course. And uh, there is um, a sort of uh, a simple answer to this. Uh, as a researcher, we do two things. So we identify new questions and we develop a strategy to uh, address these uh, questions. And usually we spend a lot of time on the strategy, uh, but so not so much time on the questions. So that's why I want to insist today on the, on the questions. And so what are the best questions uh, in science or even uh, elsewhere? Actually, the best questions are the simple questions. So I need to define what is a simple question. So a simple question is um, a question that does not require too much uh, background, so something that is uh, accessible to anyone and it means thus that the, the subject at hand is uh, to a wide audience. And a question that does not have a simple answer because otherwise it would not be a question anymore. So if it's a question that has a complex answer, it will open a new field and a new uh, research area. And that's why we want to uh, target simple questions uh, as a priority. So let's uh, go through uh, just one or two examples. So here is one simple questions, uh, simple question. Uh, how does heredity work? And uh, so this has been tackled, of course, as you know, by uh, Gregor Mendel and uh, with the study on, on peas and uh, sort of formalization through mathematics um, on uh, gene, gen genetics and heredity. And so the new field that emerged from this is genetics. So this is a typical case of a simple questions, simple question, how does heredity work? and a new field that emerged from uh, this. And so uh, a bit more recently, and this is uh, the field in which I'm the most uh, involved in, uh, here's an, another simple question, say, how do you relate gene and shape? And so you, you see that we have these two uh, sets of uh, data, let's say uh, genes and morphology, let's say, and how do we make the link between the two? And so the strategy was actually to uh, add some um, uh, mechanics and uh, physics and, uh, and the mathematics to link the two. So it, it goes like this. So from the genes, uh, we can understand how these genes and these proteins are affecting the mechanics of the cells. This is affecting the shape of the cells and the tissue. So we have the arrow from gene to shape, but you see you have to go through mechanics to have the causal links. And we can also add another arrow in the other direction, meaning that when you have a shape and growth, you can also affect the gene network, either through uh, mechanical forces, but also through uh, biochemistry, of course. And so this is a new field uh, in development that uh, some called uh, morphodynamics. Uh, but this is the same idea. You have a simple question to start with and many other questions that are emerging from uh, this field. And so this is what really uh, quantitative plant biology is about. You see that with these two examples of uh, simple questions, we try to address these simple questions by uh, formalizing an answer. And the formalization, the mathematical formalization, is really important to go to the bottom of uh, the question. And this is really what uh, quantitative plant biology uh, is about. And so if I just uh, say a few more words, uh, this is really uh, timely because we, we, are, we are generating a lot of data. Uh, it can be in uh, omics, in microscopy, like imaging, but also virtual data in, uh, in models. And so we need to make sense of all this, of course. And uh, so the quantitative approach is one way uh, to make sense of all this uh, data. And there's uh, a subcategory, let's say, of um, approach to, to answer this, is to use the, the complex systems approach. So to have a sort of a systemic view of the plant. So basically, what you, when you look at a plant, you can look at the individual elements, but actually mostly focusing on the interactions between the elements. And this is really what's more important, actually, in, in complex systems. You want to look at the rules between the elements. What, is the interacting, what are the interacting rules between the elements? And with this, we can explain uh, self-organization which is really key to uh, plant development, but also with, uh, with plant biology uh, as a whole, at uh, any scale, actually. And so with this, these are the sub-questions that we can uh, address with this uh, quantitative uh, approach. Uh, of course, we can make sense of uh, huge uh, data sets, but then we can explore also other things. So for instance, the role of the topology, so in a gene network, but also in a population network, uh, in uh, regulation, the role of stochasticity, so the randomness in, uh, in these networks, the multi-scales uh, emerging properties. So how do you go from one molecule to a wool plant? 
Uh, we can also address the questions of uh, feedback, which is very uh, sometimes very counterintuitive. Uh, we can, of course, uh, in include the forces in this. So um, it, when you use computational modeling, you can uh, address, uh, let's say, the pattern of stress uh, in, a, in a more formalized way. And we can also ask questions that relate to uh, robustness and uh, resilience. So all these are very uh, strong questions that the quantitative approach uh, can allow. I just want to finish with uh, just one uh, extra, questions, extra question, which is um, why would you need a quantitative approach uh, to generate uh, simple questions or to actually uh, address them as well? So yeah, I'll take a little detour uh, from uh, optical illusions, let's say. So hopefully you can see that uh, this image is moving, but actually it's not moving, it's your brain that is making it move. So it's an optical illusion. And this is just to illustrate the idea that our brains have limits and so that's why we need some extra help to really uh, address the physical world that is uh, surrounding us. And so the optical illusion is uh, something that is easy to grasp. So that it really shows that we have a limit in the brain. But there's been a lot of uh, studies on this. Actually, this comes down to psychology, actually, uh, showing that we have a lot of uh, cognitive biases. And this is really problematic when you do science, because as we are human beings, we uh, analyze our objects with these cognitive uh, biases. And my main message here is that the quantitative approach is a way to go around these uh, weaknesses. And so here I, I take just two examples. The, the one very well-known uh, cognitive bias we have is that we are uh, conservative. So usually we prefer to stick to our current projects. It's very rare that we change projects. We, it's, um, it's just because we know better the, the previous project and it's a safer project in a way. So it's usually harder to change uh, subjects. And actually there's this uh, famous quote from uh, Max Planck uh, saying that uh, a dogma is changing only when uh, the, the person who is in charge of that dogma dies. So it's really like an extreme case. Uh, but so hopefully with the quantitative uh, approach and the quantitative biology approach, we can use an unbiased way to address the questions. <clears throat> and this is a way to, uh, let's say, uh, go against the dogma in, uh, in a more rational way and maybe to speed up a little bit uh, this uh, change in dogma or this uh, evolution of science, let's say. This is the first example. And the second one is the systemic thinking. Uh, our brain have, have uh, I mean, our brains have a lot of difficulty with uh, feedback, for instance. So we, our, our brain is really thinking forward, but the feedback is really difficult to uh, to understand. And so here, I just take one example to illustrate this that is non-plant related. Uh, it's it's called the breast uh, paradox. And so uh, here, you have to take the the case of um, you're you're, uh, you're in a car in a traffic jam, and you think that to fix the problem. So this is a simple question. A simple question, you want to fix the traffic jam, and the simple answer would be to add an extra lane to the road. But if you do this, actually what happens is that the uh, highway becomes more attractive and there is more traffic jam. And so this is actually uh, proven now. There is uh, a lot of studies on this, uh, fluid mechanics uh, as well. So it's really a, a consolidated uh, finding. And here you have the example of the Cathy Freeway, where they, where they did this, actually. They added uh, 26 lanes, and the traffic jams actually got worse. So it really shows that the human brain has difficulty with uh, this uh, feedback idea. And so we can apply this to, to plants at any scale. Uh, it's really difficult to understand feedback, so you can do it at the molecular level, the cellular level. Here I take a very large uh, plant-related question, which is uh, food security. Uh, so if, if you look at the issue of food security, uh, the first thing that would come to mind is that we need to increase the production, the yield uh, of plants, right? So that's one way to fix uh, the problem of food security. But actually, is it? Because if you do this, you're going to make uh, the distribution problem worse and the waste worse as well. So actually, there's more and more uh, people thinking that actually increasing production is not a good idea to fix the food security problem. And so this means that uh, having a quantitative approach is really important to know what to do, of course, but also to approach the question of uh, robustness and resilience, the questions that I, I mentioned uh, earlier. And so this is, uh, of course, linked to societal questions and uh, a, re a revolution that really quantitative plant biology wants uh, to take uh, to take on in the in the journal is the, the revolution of citizen science. 
in which uh, it's not only scientists who are collecting data, but also uh, citizens. And so they collect data in uh, all over the place. Uh, they can uh, collect uh, heterogeneous uh, data. And so we need to make sense of all this. So this is opening a lot of uh, challenges in terms of how we deal with this data. But it's also uh, massive, right? Because you can have millions of data from uh, all over the planet. And so this is really a very interesting challenge, and we, we, I hope that the journal will be supporting this, uh, this effort. So to conclude, I'm very happy to, uh, to support this, uh, this journal, Quantitative Plant Biology, because I think it's really going to, um, to stimulate an effort in the plant community to have a bit more formalization of the questions and also to address uh, new questions and new and important questions. Thank you. Thanks, Olivier. Um, that was really interesting. Um, yep. I have a couple of questions for you. Um, what is quantitative plant biology and how is it different from systems biology? I think you answered some of those already, but... Yeah, yeah, no, I, no it's, that's a good question, actually, because uh, you, one could think that systems biology and quantitative plant, plant biology are the same. I would rather say that systems biology is a sub part of quantitative plant biology. Uh, in quantitative plant biology, you can use the, the system complex uh, approach, but you can also use the stochastic uh, approach, like to, uh, to make, for instance, correlation between uh, big data and the phenotype, but not being causal or multi-scale. You can just um, address the two, the two sets. You can also have uh, a more descriptive uh, view on, on the, um, the plant, basically, so to have a lot of quantitative data on the plant, which can feed models for others. So it doesn't have to be a full integrated uh, system in a way. It can be uh, bits and uh, pieces. Lit. OK, thank you. Um, a question about citizen science as well. Um, what is citizen science and why is it important for plant biology particularly? Yeah, so uh, I think citizen science is important. I mean, right now it's it's um, it, it's there, of course, but it's not dominant in the labs. I mean, we still do a lot of science in the lab in a very controlled manner. But there's, uh, I mean, I guess for multiple reasons. So one is that uh, more and more citizens they want to contribute to the science and they are interested, and so we want to really open the door to this. So citizen science is doing this. But we also um, uh, maybe we are not satisfied anymore with our, our sample size in a way. So if we have 30 plants uh, that, and we have a statistically significant uh, result, it's, it doesn't compare with the millions of plants from the field that are in natural conditions with more variation and everything. So it's much more relevant for the real plant environment. So for at least for these two reasons, that's an important direction. One was it about why should we publish in why should we publish in quantitative plant biology as opposed to other journals? <laughs> Well, I mean, because, I mean of course, I, I, there are some great journals uh, out there, but uh, this one, uh, has, um, I would say it has, it has a broad scope and is really um, uh, broadcasting or showcasing the quantitative aspect, which I think is really the future of uh, plant biology or actually of biology. Actually. And so this is really an important component of, uh, of the journal. We, we really want to uh, be interdisciplinary. And so this is it goes with the quantitative uh, aspect. And so I think there will be uh, very interesting questions that we will address in this journal because of that um, term. Thank you. 